Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you to our midweek video for this week. We appreciate you tuning in. I'd like to welcome you to our YouTube channel here, Grace Life Bible on YouTube. If you haven't already done so, if you would consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bells, a way of staying current with the ministry, we would certainly appreciate that. <clears throat> also want to remind you about our Rumble channel, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. <clears throat> This is our alt tech site should something happen to our YouTube ministry. So if you're in alt tech sites or would just like an alternative to YouTube, please consider subscribing and checking us out here online as well. Lately, I've been featuring two books in these messages. The first one is my co-authored book on J.C. O'Hare and the Origins of the American Grace Movement, 1899 to 1958. It's a co-authored book written by myself and my former professor, uh, Dr. Dale DeWitt covers the emergence of the American Grace Movement and the history of dispensationalism in the United States, as well as I've also been featuring my smaller, shorter book, Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger, Assessing His Life, Ministry, and Impact. This book covers some brief information about the history of an important dispensational thinker and focuses primarily on nailing down exactly when and where and how the Acts 28 dispensational position came into existence during the life and ministry of E.W. Bollinger. So if you, uh, you would consider supporting us and helping the ministry out by picking up a copy of those, either one of those books, we'd certainly appreciate that as they are related to our topic of late, which is my interaction with Daniel G. Hummel's book, The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, How the Evangelical Battle Over the End Times Shaped a Nation. And so far, we have six uh, episodes in this particular series. This will be number seven that I'm uh, recording here right now. We have now succeeded in fully unpacking the introductory, introductory materials. We've talked about the forward and the preface in episode number one. In episode number two, we talked about the history of the term dispensationalism and rightly dividing dispensationalism. And I believe in number three, yes, number three, we talked about historical boundaries. In number four, I talked about my interactions with the author, uh, Daniel G. Hummel. And then in five and six, we rounded out our discussion of the introduction by looking at the end times and everything else, and then dispensationalism and time and space. So then that brings us kind of into part one, which is the new premillennialist, 1830 to 1900. And what I'm going to do is I, I still have the book in front of me. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm not going to read all the chapters. I'm going to be a little bit more selective as far as um, what I'm covering. I did read the entire introduction and all the front material because I thought it was important to get a, a understanding of the book. So what I'm going to do is just kind of hit the highlights and what I perceive to be the main points from chapter one as we work our way through this. Okay, But again, note the structure of the book. Part one is about the new premillennialists, 1830 to 1900. And chapter one is titled Across an, Across an Ocean. And this is really looking at the life and ministry of Darby, the context in which Darby sort of began to develop his theological concepts and ideas, and then uh, sort of where that kind of went from there. So Darby is an interesting figure. Um he, if my memory's not mistaken, he's born in 1800, so it's pretty easy to track how old Darby is at any given point. You just have to look at a calendar. So, for example, in 1825, he turns 25 years old. He's pretty easy to track with when it comes to that. And in the first section of Chapter 1, Across the Ocean, Hummel kind of gets into some basic stuff. Um, he deals with his riding accident the fact that Darby had a riding accident in 1826, 1827, and it was during a period of convalescence where he really started to uh, dive deep into the scriptures and began to sort of uh, uncover some things related to dispensational truth during that point. He does make an interesting point here. He says Darby's voluminous writings from 1827 till his death in 1882 numbering some 19 million words, okay? Darby wrote a lot. This is a picture of my bookshelf, and this entire shelf right here where my cursor is is the collected uh, the collected works of Darby. Fills a whole shelf on my bookshelf here at home. Um, to say he was voluminous is an understatement. He wrote a ton of material in which he aired his grievances with the Church of England, 
He talks about uh, apocalyptic, te apocalyptic teachings and other things. And on page 20 uh, in this section, Hummel says, Darby developed a radical understanding of the church as a heavenly and lay-run body that informed his broader theological project, okay? Um, and so he's uh, talking here about the church Israel heaven earth distinction that is going to play heavy into Darby's um, theology. He says on page 21, Darby's lasting contribution was in building three theological innovations into an interlocking set of teachings, a new theology of the church, a new theology of the millennium, and a new dualism between heaven and earth that informed how he read the entire Bible. So um, Hummel's doing a pretty good job there summarizing some of the basic concepts uh, of Darby and how they are, are the, how they come to be, okay? Now, Darby does not think that this is a novel interpretation. He says, I don't care, I do not care for novel interpretations of scripture, Darby wrote, cream lies on the surface. And then Hummel adds, though, but his innovations, which he insisted were recoveries, rather than novelties still set him in a different set him in a different theological direction so darby is insistent that he is not innovating in the sense of coming up with new stuff he's recovering things that had been in the bible the whole time that other people have ignored that is darby's testimony for himself okay and of course this leads into ultimately the the brethren movement uh the plymouth brethren movement um, and by 1835, Hummel says on page 21, Darby was aggrieved enough to attack the idea of apostolic succession, core to the Anglican, under, uh, Anglican understanding of church authority. So this goes to what we said in an earlier episode, that this is a dissenting movement. Okay, The Brethren movement, Darby, D Darby's movement is going to be about dissenting from the organized church. Okay. Uh, also on page 21, he says the brethren would become known for their aversion to a clergy class, every man his own priest. But Darby's focus on ruination revealed another aspect of the brethren's project. For the most part, the mission of the brethren was aimed at nominal or otherwise cultural Christians who made up the organized church of Christianity. So that's an interesting point, that one of the main early goals of the Brethren movement was not necessarily to go out and preach the gospel and evangelize. I'm not saying they didn't do that because they did, but part of their goal was to focus on the um, nominal or cultural Christians within the Church of England and try to spur them into a deeper understanding of the Word of God. Okay, On page 22, on page 22, uh, Darby's view of the church was the foundation for his view of the future, reacting against the establishment ethos of post-millennialism or teaching that it was organized Christianity that would usher in the millennium of peace. Darby adopted a premillennial eschatology that looked for the ruin of the church as a precursor to the second coming. So this, is, again, is an important point. Darby is not post-millennial. Darby does not believe that the church is going to usher in the kingdom age. Darby believed the church would fall into ruin, that the dispensation would end, and from there things would advance on a much different trajectory. So Darby is a pre-millennialist, not a post-millennialist. Hummel goes on to say, until the early 1830s, he promoted a pre-millennialism that assured that a proper decoding of biblical prophecy would reveal the exact date of Christ's return. Okay, now what he's talking about there is what is known as historic uh, premillennialism today. Okay, um, but it was a it was a premillennialism as as I try to describe in one of the earlier uh, videos. You might also hear of it referred to as killism. Okay, that's all talking about the same thing. If you're interested in learning more about killism or historic premillennialism, you're going to want to check out this book right here, A Case for Historic Premillennialism, an alternative to the left behind eschatology. This is edited by Craig Bloomberg and Sun Wok Chung. Okay. Or your other option is to check out uh, these videos right here in the Grace History Project. Uh, Lesson 44, Millenarianism, Forging a Narrative for Truth's Resurgence, Part 1. And then there's also a Part 2. 
So I will leave a link in the description for this video to the lessons on millenarianism as a narrative. But Darby's particular brand of premillennial understanding of the scripture, different from postmillennialism and different from historic premillennialism or killism, is um, going to be a driving force behind his theology. Okay. Now, at the time, there's also a bunch of prophetic conferences that are happening uh, in Great Britain. Um, and this becomes known as the old premillennialism. This 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 historic premillennialism is also known as old premillennialism versus new premillennialism, which is the idea that Christ uh, that there's a that there's a rapture and that we are not living within the Book of Revelation currently at this point. Okay, so you have the Powers Court conferences, you have a lot of the Aubrey conferences, you have a lot of different things happening in England around this time. Okay, bottom of page twenty two. Hummel says that uh, the prophetic timeline was stalled in a parenthesis period. So these are Darby's novelties, according to Hummel. He says here Darby offered two key novelties. The prophetic timeline was stalled in a parenthesis period, which the kingdom was postponed at Daniel's 69th week, leaving one week of seven years to completion. And that this parenthesis would be concluded by the rapture of the church into heaven an event other premillennialists place at the end of the prophesied tribulations. In theological terminology introduced much later, post-tribulational and pre-tribulational would distinguish the old from the new premillennialist views on the rapture. So Darby is going to realize the difference between the church and Israel, the heavenly purpose of God and the earthly purpose of God, the earthly purpose related to his uh, plans, prophetic plans through the nation of Israel to establish a kingdom on the earth and his heavenly plan related to the church, the body of Christ, that was a mystery kept secret since the world began to how he would use the church in the heavenly places. These, this, these two things, again, the idea that the, there's a parenthesis period, that the kingdom program, the prophetic program was suspended at the completion of the 69th week the 79th week, the, the 70th week, excuse me, awaits a future fulfillment, and the church of this dispensation fits into, into a parenthesis between the 69th and the 70th week. These are what Hummel is identifying as Darby's major tweaks to the old premillennialist understanding, which had which saw the rapture at the end of the 70th week. Okay. And so this now is going to emerge a new premillennialism. Now, the new premillennialism is going to reject, okay, so page 23, he rejected the day-year symbolism for 1,260 days and insisted that this period of tribulation lay in the near future. In later theological terminology, the new premillennialism Darby espoused was defined as futurist, meaning it was future for its emphasis that the most, that most of biblical prophecy remained to be fulfilled in the near future rather than the historicist, the historical premillennialists, which correlated historical reign of Justinian or the French Revolution to prophecy. So the historical premillennialists, the old premillennialists, saw us as living at a definitive point in time within the book of Revelation. They saw the French Revolution as significant, and they disagreed, though, whether we were in Revelation 15, 16, 17, the old premillennials would disagree about those things, okay? Now, um, he also goes on to talk about Darby's uh, grievances against the established churches um, that he wanted to separate from these uh, churches as far as the, the denominational structures and frameworks. Um, he thought there was a true church and that the established churches of Christendom were in ruin, and that part of what should happen is that the believers should remove themselves from these um, denom these traditional denominational structures. These distinctions were governed by a fundamental dualism between heaven and earth, which permeated everything Darby thought and wrote. For the most, um, let me see here, ba, ba, ba. these separations informed how Darby read the Bible. It was a book telling the story of God's redemption of all things, through two chosen peoples, Israel and the church, okay? Um, other concepts of dispensations or divisions of time was not new in Christian thought, 
But Darby's twist was that these dispensations correlated with the church-Israel distinction and always ended in failure. So this is where test failure, traditional test failure judgment dispensationalism comes from. The Bible told the story of successive, successive dispensations involving Israel mostly or the church that each ended in tragedy, each no sooner fully established than, uh, than it provided proved a failure. Such a test failure cycle pervaded all aspects of Darby's vision of the Bible and the Christian faith. The dispensation supplied a strong dose of Christian pessimism to the Brethren cause, mixed with an uh, appreciation of God's extraordinary grace. So what he's doing there is he's sort of unpacking uh, this. In the next section of the preface, um, and I'm sorry, of chapter one, Hummel talks about evangelizing denominations. And it's in this section here. I'm not going to say a ton about it, but in this section, it's the idea of how the established church is in ruin and how um, they targeted early on the denominational structures for converts. So just a couple points here on this subsection, page 26, for the brethren, who were aggressive in their maintenance of reformed theological boundaries, individual holiness was important primarily for its reform potential in the wider apostate church. In the 1850s, Brethren quickly grew concerned about the bulk of revival energy was being channeled into individualistic reform based on faulty Wesleyan notions of sanctification while ignoring the deeper ruination of the church. So, they're very concerned about this. Brethren became some of the most outspoken op opponents of revivalism in the English-speaking world. Exclusive brethren focused on evangelizing denominations. The apostate churches themselves, fellow Christians. Theirs was a revival within Christendom. This is page 27. That is calling out of Christians from worldly Christendom into the heavenly church. Brethren regarded the difference as one between evangelism and teaching, between introducing the gospel and reintroducing right faith, teaching or giving lectures on scripture to Christians. Okay, So then this is obviously going to be um, transported ultimately to North America, as we'll see in the next section. The third subsection is on popularizing Darby. Okay, And let me just say, Darby's not easy to read. I have the whole collection here like I showed you. All this whole shelf is all Darby. Darby is not easy to read. And there are later and other brethren writers who are definitely sort of more skilled at writing, dare I say, more communicative, more easy to understand, okay? Popularizing brethren teachings was always a trade-off between accessibility and precision. In a transaction that Darby himself rarely made, but that his brother and colleagues trafficked in constantly, okay? Now, that means that the other brethren are going to be, Darby's sort of the main thinker, and many of the other brethren writers are the popularizers, people like William Trotter, okay? William Trotter is famous for the eight lectures on prophecy that he delivered in March and April in 1851. This is a very famous book. William Trotter, about this book, Hummel says, William Trotter and Thomas Smith were a brother and duo who wrote the first comprehensive distillation of Darby's eschatology to reach North America. Eight lectures on prophecy. I have my own copy of eight lectures on prophecy in a compilation book called Plain Papers on Prophetic and Other Subjects. And this was uh, edited by a guy named Roy Hebner. And he has a whole introduction to this and a preface um, describing the eight lectures and how they made inroads into North America. Okay, so this is definitely an interesting book. If you're interested into this topic, you're going to want to pick up plain. Uh, what was this here? Plain papers on prophetic and other subjects. So Trotter is going to be one of the first popularizers of Darby in North America. The book provided a manual for the study of prophecy rightly conducted that soft launched a popular version of the dualism and literalism underlying exclusive brother and theology the intended audience was not lost souls but troubled saints these lectures were delivered and are now printed for the benefit of christians 
almost or altogether unacquainted with the subjects which they treat, the authors began. Okay, In their lectures, Trotter and Smith presented a case for the new premillennialism while never mentioning Darby by name. Okay, This was strategic as they presented their arguments as emerging directly from Scripture and not the reasonings and speculations of men. So they are very sort of, these are the popularizers. Another one is C.H. McIntosh, okay? Uh, Moody, Dwight Moody, said that he could live without all the other books in his library outside, the, the two, the thing outside of his Bible that he could not live without were the writings of C.H. McIntosh. Now, another thing I want to touch on here in the subsection on popularizing Darby is the discussion here. Uh, let's see. Yet, yet what was gained in Trotter and Smith's presentation was counterbalanced with what was lost. The eight lectures focused narrowly on prophetic study, unbundling Darby's views of the future from his separatist and anti-clerical positions. The reader could agree with the lectures and adopt a premillennial reading of Scripture, but remain entrenched in the churches. Now, this is an important point. What Trotter does here in this book is he untangles and extracts out of Darby's voluminous writings his teaching about eschatology and says nothing about separatism from the denominational church, etc. So you could you could embrace the prophetic teaching that is presented in the in this book without having to leave your denomination, without having to leave your established church. And this was something that always bothered Darby about the Americans who were the 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 North Americans, what be it Canadian or American who were embracing his views because they never left their traditional denominational structures. Darby's dualism worked behind the words of the lectures and could be detected by the initiated, but the outsider could easily miss the integral link between eschatology and ecclesiology. Now, Hummel's not real positive in that statement there, but there's, there's a popularizing movement now that is happening with Darby. Now, he mentions also Charles Stanley, an itinerant brethren evangelist who traveled the United Kingdom distributing thousands of his own tracts. Now, you can look this guy up and see all of his tracts on different Brethren websites, okay? Um, but he does a very famous one here called Coming Events as Revealed in Scripture, okay? Notice this, with illustrative diagram. And this is from originally, let me see here. I want to say this was originally done in... Ba, ba, ba. The, the date is, uh, uh, let's see here, um, well, they only have the date for the 5th edition. But if you scroll down, you can see what becomes known as the prophecy chart. And I'm pointing this out because this becomes a major feature of dispensationalism. Here, so here's the illustrative diagram, okay? The line represents the past history of Israel, and then he explains what, what all this means. But now you have... Arguably, for the first time, one of the first dispensational charts to make a visual understanding of dispensational time. Okay, and this was put together by a guy named Charles Stanley. Not can be not to be uh, confused with the recent, recently uh, departed Southern Baptist preacher that becomes known as the prophecy chart. It's also known as the illustrative diagram, and here is the title right here, along with the different explanations okay um so it's it's crude it's rudimentary but it is arguably one of the first dispensational diagrams now moving forward dispensational timelines diagrams all this are going to be immensely popular in the dispensational movement as teaching aids to help people understand what is being said okay uh, a couple things here that Hummel says um, about this, about Stanley. Yet more than his track, Stanley provided an enduring visual representation of one aspect of Darby's teachings, the progression of dispensational time. The illustrative diagram captured dispensational time in its most simplified and therefore most visual form. 
So therefore, this is massively impactful upon people when they see it for the first time. These works tended to include significant scriptural paraphrasing or full passages illustrating in heavy-handed fashion the mediation between text and image. Often drawn in color or on large paper, these charts, these charts were displayed to be mounted either on holliers, in uh, covers, on frames, or otherwise for teaching and sacred decoration in the home. So almost as soon as a dispensational movement emerges, so too does the need to illustrate and diagram the understanding of dispensational time and premillennial eschatology. Like Trotter and Smith's eight lectures, Stanley's diagram held immense popularizing potential, but it also distorted Darby's intended bundling of eschatology, of ecclesiology, eschatology, and biblical hermeneutics. So what ends up happening here is people begin to embrace a form of Darby's teaching. Now, another very important piece here that Hummel mentions briefly is this, the companion to two prophetical charts, uh, the first of which illustrates the 70 weeks of Daniel, while the second is intended to show the 70 weeks is dispensational cycle in the Lord's dealing with Israel and also with man universally by Sir Edward Denny, and this is from 1849. Now, this is over 200 pages. I don't have time to scroll through all of this, but notice there's a companion and charts, and this is designed to explain these charts. So very early on, all of this is serving now to popularize dispensationalism, the, the Darbyite version of dispensationalism that is emerging. Okay, And I also want to remind you about this book right here, Discovering Dispensationalism, Tracing the Development of Dispensational Thought from the 1st to the 21st Century. And in this book, Darby is not called, Darby is the innovator, he is not the inventor. He's not inventing dispensational truth. He is innovating it and explaining it in new ways. Just as we saw earlier in this episode where Darby doesn't view him, Darby views himself as recovering things that were in the scripture the entire time that the organized church that he views that is an apostasy has missed. Okay. And then the last subsection of uh, chapter, where are we at here? Of chapter one is hymns of doctrine. And I'm not going to say a whole lot about that other than to say that these um, dispensational and premillennial concepts were very early on um, put into hymns. And many of these hymns became popular hymns that became sung widely. Okay, uh, For example, on page 33, Brethren, uh, Hummel writes, Bre Brethren hymns taught, taught the dreariness of the world and all that belongs to it, the full assurance of faith, and the completeness of the Christian in Christ. In no less exacting fashion than Trotter or Stanley, Denny fixed his creative output on conveying the core truths and implications of Darby's teachings for a lay audience. And so uh, he concludes the, the, the chapter by talking about um, if the Metropole of Brethren Empire was tracks, uh, of tracks was the um, Paranoster Street of London, I think I said that right, where each year millions of pages began their journeys in, into the English-speaking world. The Great Lakes Basin in North America was the periphery, periphery, periphery region that would receive a uh, repropriate brother in truth for its own purposes, and in doing so, remake the legacy of the brethren in America. And that kind of uh, forecasts what chapter two is going to be about. Now, in full transparency, again, I've not read every word. I've just tried to give you a highlight of uh, what chapter one is about, and then direct you towards other resources you might find. The Case for Historic Premillennialism by Bloomberg and Chung. Um, plain Papers on Prophetic Subjects by Trotter. Also, The Discovery of uh, Discovering Dispensationalism, edited by Marsh and uh, Fazio, as well as 
show you a couple things. So again, just a reminder that um, if you want to know about millenarianism as forging a narrative for truth resurgence, you're going to want to check out the links in the description, lesson 44, 45, 46 from the Grace History Project. And then I also want to leave you with this playlist called The Essential Darby. This goes all the way back to 1826, 1827, when Darby was injured in a riding accident and had to convalesce where he began to, and all he did was study his Bible, and he began to rediscover some things related to dispensational understanding of the scripture, okay? So you have <clears throat> what was troubling John Nelson Darby, uh, John Nelson Darby and the early resurgence of Pauline truth, Darby and the founding of the Plymouth Brethren, the consolidation, refinement, and advancement in truth in the mind of Darby, 1827 to 1840, the Powers Court Conferences, three studies on Darby on trial, debunking um, attacks on the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Those three are important because I show you how, and I walk you through how, once Darby understood the distinction between Israel and the church, the heavenly purpose of the church, and the earthly purpose that God had for the nation of Israel, the timing of the rapture fell into place as pre-tribulational or pre-70th week, okay? Then there's a, a series of studies on an overview of Darby's dispensational system, and then finally his North American ministry here, which is Coming to America, JND's North American ministry. So there are 12 videos here walking you through a wide swath of the life and ministry of John Nelson Darby, and his impact, and then ultimately his ministry in North America. When we resume the next video, we will cover chapter two, which is that exact topic, the American Mission Field. So make sure you check out the description under this video. There'll be links to a lot of different goodies there for you to avail yourself of if you're interested in learning more about the subjects that we've covered in this video. So if you are enjoying this series, please like the video, leave a comment, share the video on social media, subscribe to our channel, ring the alarm bell, uh, follow us online, tell your friends about what you're learning here and what you're getting uh, uh, from these videos. Make sure you avail yourself of the information in the description. And the most important thing I could ever tell you about is your salvation, your justification. God loves you. Christ died for your sins. He sent his son into the world, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law so that we might receive the adoption of sons. We, as members of the church, the body of Christ, have been adopted into the family of God and have been made a full adult sons and given a sonship status in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've never made the choice to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you've never made the, if you never come to a place where you've realized that you're a sinner, that you cannot save yourself, that on your best day, your best effort, your best work will leave you short of the glory of God. Trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. He died for your sin. He was buried. He rose again. And when you place your faith into the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, resurrection, as the only payment for your sin, he'll give you eternal life as a free gift. Trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your attention. We'll see you next time.